Mahdi's that have that have shown up in, in in history. Let's start with what we mentioned last time that some of the the Rafidis, what they used to be called back then, today we call them the Shia, claimed that the Mahdi is the last of their twelve Imams. So these are the twelver Shias, and his name will be Muhammad ibn al Hasan al Askari, and they believe he's from the descendants of of al Hussein, not al Hasan, as we Sunnis believe. They believe that he entered the tunnel of Samarra in the year 260 after the Hijrah. So he was alive, went into that cave, and he's not going to come out until it's time to come out. One very important thing to remember when you do something like that, and like the Shia say, the Mahdi even knows what's happening on earth right now. Then is this a plus or a minus? It's a huge negative, it's a huge minus to be alive and see all the destruction and all the death that's happening to, to the Muslims. Muslims are dying by the millions. And you're just sitting there and you're not saying a word. This doesn't make any sense. It takes away from the greatness of the individual when you make them alive and careless. Now the, oh, what's funny is they believe that when he entered the, the cave, he was five years old. So like a five-year-old just wa walking to a cave is like, okay, see you in a thousand years. I'm going to stay here for a while. That was some belief about the Mahdi. Others, uh, there was a, a man who said by the name of Abdullah ibn Saba, and he claimed that Ali ibn Abi Talib was the awaited Mahdi. And uh, poor Ali radiallahu anhu, they said he was the Mahdi. All right? They said he was supposed to be the, the Prophet. Then they said, astaghfirullah, some group during his lifetime said he was Allah. Astaghfirullah. Then some people said he was the Dabba. The Dabba is the beast that comes towards the end of time. We're going to talk about it, inshallah. They said he was the Dabba. And the scholars argue there's no... There's never a time, ever, in the Arabic language when you refer to a human being as a dab. But they're just trying to make Ali Radul on everything. The third, um, this man by the name of Mukhtar ibn Ubaid al Thaqafi, he claimed that Muhammad ibn Hanafiya was the Mahdi. Of course, he was a righteous man, he never claimed to be the Khalifa, but they, people, or this man specifically, said he was the Khalifa. Then we have uh, a man who was given the nickname Muhammad the Nafs al Zakiya. His name was Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn al Hassan ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib. So, this was the son of al Hassan. Now, what's interesting here is that look at the name Muhammad ibn Abdullah, and then he is from the lineage of al Hassan, and he's ibn Abdullah ibn al Hassan, immediately ibn Ali. Very close, <laughs> the lineage is right there, but too soon, don't you think? Like, just few generations later, it's the Mahdi and the Dajjal supposed to come, like it's supposed to be the end of time that quickly, right? What did I tell you in the beginning of this series? People are always guilty of thinking all the signs are going to happen in their world, in their lifetime. So, uh, he was actually a very righteous person who, who you know, was a devout worshipper and always praying and worshipping. And he led a revolt, and this was a very popular revolt of Muhammad the Nafs Zakiya. He tried to t he overthrow. He, he tried to overthrow the Abbasids. Why? Because one of the one of the things is that Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, used to very much uh, support him verbally, monetarily. He wanted him to overthrow them because the Abbasids were being very unjust and, and very unfair to the to Ahl al Bayt, the family of the Prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Without going on for too long, Muhammad the Nafs Zakiya he rebelled against the Abbasid Khalifa al Mansur and the rebellion. Uh, failed, but many people started saying or were saying that he was a Mahdi, and of course, clearly he wasn't. There was another individual, this man, his name was uh, Ubaidullah ibn Maymun. They mentioned that his grandfather was Jewish. He was the leader of the Qaramita, and I told you about the Qaramita, if you remember the episode when we spoke about the destruction and, and of the stealing the black stone, killing the Hujjaj, and all that stuff that happened by the Qaramita. And they also said, you know, that he was the Mahdi. And they, they falsely claimed that he belonged to Ahl al-Bayt, like they basically, they faked his lineage to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, we have this one, his name was, he's famous as Ibn Tumart. His name was Muhammad Ibn Abdullah al-Barbari. So he was from the Berber, not an Arab. 
And that's why he's known as Ibn Tumart. And he appeared in the year 512 or 513 or 14 after the Hijrah. And first of all, he claimed to be a descendant from Ali ibn Abi Talib. And he actually traveled for a while and sought knowledge and became, you know, fairly knowledgeable. But he also picked up from those, the khawarij, the, the takfir, if you commit a major sin, you've left Islam. And he became very, very relaxed with Muslim blood. And he was very strict even with his own followers. He had a rule that his followers, those who believed in him and followed him, they have to make qiyam every night. And if they don't, they get whipped in the morning. And he employed a number of very dirty tricks to prove to them that he can do something out of the ordinary so that they can believe he's something special. So one of the things he would do is that he would come, uh, he'd bring his followers, and they would dig graves in the cemetery. And then they would bury his friends. So, you know, your friend's going to help you out here. So we've got six friends. We dig a, six graves. And then we put them in. And we, not very, kind of a shallow grave. We cover it. Then he goes to the market. And he tells people that uh, I will show you a miracle. He'll just come and bring a whole crowd from the marketplace. And then he'll bring him out to the cemetery. And he'll stand there. And he'll tell people. O oh, dead ones, O oh, deceased, respond to my call. And then his friends from inside, they yell, You are Al Mahdi, you are the Mahdi, that, the awaited Mahdi. So people are standing there, and then they hear, like from these different graves, people are speaking. They'll go to this grave, two graves here, and two people said, You are the awaited Mahdi. He'll go over there, O oh, deceased ones, speak to me. You are the awaited Mahdi. They go to another group, it's like, do that a number of times, right? Now, here's the thing. Now he has to let his followers out, right? He has to get them out of there <laughs> because they helped him in this. But if the, he gets them out, then people come back to show their friends. We stood right here. He did it. I heard a sound from this grave. Then they look at the ground and they see that the earth has been moved again. And like the grave has been basically exhumed and then recovered. They'll figure out what he was doing. So out of fear of risking that, he would actually just leave his followers there, he would just leave them to die. Really evil, really wicked, but at the same time, you know, he's deviant, they're deviant, so I don't know if they got what they deserved or not, but then there was another person who claimed to be the Mahdi, he claimed to be the Mahdi when he was 38 years old, Muhammad Ahmad ibn Abdullah, and he was from Sudan, and this was, you no, know, recently basically, in, in like around 1885 basically. But one of the things like he also changed, for example, he added to the five pillars uh, or, or changed the shahada around and he said anyone who doubted that he's a Mahdi becomes a kafir, becomes a disbeliever and it's obviously clear that he was not the Mahdi. If he did anything good is that he did fight and help expel the British people out of Sudan. So we'll give him that credit because anyone who gets the British out of anywhere uh, seems to be a good person. And the last one that we'll spend our last five minutes on, this is something that happened about uh, in 1979. Someone claimed to be the Mahdi. But if you want to, to, to see the story from like, why would young people who were righteous, otherwise they were righteous young men, do something like this? So let's put it this way. There was a young man, his name was Muhammad ibn Abdullah, and he had the aquiline nose, he had this prominent forehead, he looked like the Mahdi, he had the name of the Mahdi, I'm not sure about his lineage. And imagine one day, someone just comes to him, this happened, someone comes to him, who has never met him before, says, hey, I saw you in a dream. We were in the Kaaba, we were pledging to you as the Mahdi, it was you. And then, a while later, someone else, a complete other stranger, who doesn't know you and doesn't know the first guy, comes to you and says the same exact dream, people pledging to you because you're the Mahdi. Then a third person sees that, who doesn't know the first two. A completely random fourth person says the same thing. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twenty times, what will happen? After a while you believe, you pledge to yourself you're the Mahdi. So that's one of the things, the shaitan had a role in this and, and he brought this dream to a number of people. A number of people had seen that dream and there was the, the really the brains behind the operation, a man by the name of Juhayman ibn Saif al-Utaybi, who uh, was very convinced that this is the Mahdi, and they had about 200 people 
and on uh, an awaited day, this is November 20th, 1979, they, at Fajr prayer, they entered with some janazas. In the good old days, things were beautiful and innocent, right? And every time someone does something wrong, new safety measures are put in place and there's more paperwork. Back then, you could just come in with, with a deceased on, on, a, on a bed and lead the salah and then leave. And have the salah led over them and then leave. Now you need certificates of, and all that it has to come through channels because of this incident, incident, really, where they came in with these janazas, but they were actually not janazas, they were just ammunition and weapons that were covered. So, after the Fajr prayer, this man, Juhayman ibn Saif al utaybi he got up and he grabbed the microphone and he began to pontificate and give a long lecture about the corruption and the evil and all the things that are happening. And then he says, and I have with me a man who is the Mahdi and we'll all give pledge to him. Now, the Imam of the Haram was able to sneak out at this point and then they got up, they brought the, the, the Mahdi, which now already doesn't fit the story. All right? It doesn't fit the story that he leaves Medina fleeing to Mecca. That didn't happen. It, uh, they bring him out of his home and force him to accept the pledge. That also didn't happen. He didn't even have a home in Mecca. And they forced him to accept the pledge, but he wasn't forced to accept it. He wanted the pledge. Why was he there? Why was he part of this 200 people who had this plan? So then they, they went and they now have the haram under, they have snipers on the minarets and they have weapons and they have people everywhere. And they trapped like 50,000 people inside the haram. And they sent the army. So in the beginning it was chaos, people were confused, people weren't sure what was going on. Even some respectable scholars started to think this maybe is the Mahdi. And then others, then it took people a while until everyone realized, okay, this is definitely not the Mahdi. So they ordered the army to go in and to basically return uh, to free the Haram. But the army refused to go because they know the Hadith of the Mahdi being in the Kaaba. The army is sent to destroy him and then it's swallowed up when it gets to Bayda. So they refused to go in the beginning. And then after a while, after a while it became clear, you know, these are a bunch of people, young people with, with weapons and they're really just bringing fear in, into people's hearts and destroying the, the haram and so it became clear to them this is not the Mahdi and then they went in with their tanks into the haram. This, w this took two weeks by the way, two weeks they were barricaded in the haram and so what happened was then the, the Juhayman and his people, I'm not going to say the Mahdi but Juhayman and his people, they went down into the basement of uh, like where they have Zamzam and all that and um, they burnt like they smoked them out with like burnt tires that's why if you ever see pictures of the captives they were, had like black faces with soot on them then they flooded that area they electrocuted it and in they caught i think about 63 i think of uh, of them were captured alive including juhayman himself but the man who was supposed to be the mahdi died in the firefight he didn't make it and then the others the 63 that were captured 58 of them were in different parts of the, the kingdom and then that was the end of that fitna which became known as fitna al-haram or fitna juhayman. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.